you have a Bible, go to Acts 18. Come on. We get excited about the Word of God. We shout when we open up the Bible. And I want to title this message, Identity Issues. Identity Issues. We're going to go through a couple of um, passages here. And so just bear with me in this first couple of minutes. Uh, but you, you know what? This church, we love reading the Word of God. The Word of God is never like boring. It's always exciting. And so I want to read to you a couple passages from Acts 18, and then we're going to go into 19. But this is really a, a message that deals with who we are. Who are you? Why are you here? What is your purpose? We say every week, I'm here on purpose because I have a purpose. But the enemy always tries to come at us with questions about our identity, trying to uh, stir up insecurity, inadequacy, a lack of purpose, a lack of significance, a feeling of uh, just, you know, am I valuable? Am I, like, am I worthy? Um, do I even have a purpose? What is my job? Is my job who I am? Um, and is my salary my value? Is my net worth really how, how God views me? And, and, and oftentimes we move in the direction of our own self-image. So if we have a poor self-image, if we have a very um, just shaky identity, and one day we feel good about ourselves, the next day we feel ugly, we feel terrible, we feel overweight, we feel uh, unqualified, we feel like we're not a good parent or not a good spouse or just not doing good in life, we move in the direction of our value, our own uh, self-evaluation. And it's important for us to come back to how does God see me? How did God make me? How did God create me in his image to be who he's called me to be and to walk with a daily firm foundation of our identity being in Christ? Somebody say, in Christ. In Christ. So in Acts 18, Paul left Athens and he went to Corinth and um, he meets these two sweet, precious people, Priscilla and Aquila, husband and a wife from Italy. And they both make tents just like Paul. So Paul was a tent maker. That's how he made his money. That's how he made his money, but that's not who he was. Just because you do something that makes money doesn't mean that's who you are. Just because you're a coach or you uh, are a teacher or, or uh, you're a businessman, that doesn't mean that's who you are. That's just what you do. Paul made tents but he was a child of God. Paul preached sermons, but that's not his identity. His identity was not in being a preacher on a stage or a tent maker in the marketplace. His identity is that he was a child of God. That's important. If you're taking notes this morning, by the way, note takers are history makers and we retain the word better. But if you're taking notes, just write this. What you do is not who you are. Amen? Amen. That's good news because listen, Sometimes you're doing something good, and sometimes you're doing something that's not so good. Anyone done something you're not proud of? Ten of us in the room, the rest of y'all, the altar call is at the end. We will invite you down. Uh, but the rest of us, listen, when we do something we're not proud of, we can feel like, oh my goodness, I'm a failure because I failed. No, 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 you're not a failure. And anyways, here's the other thing, just because you make a mistake or fail, Listen, that's an opportunity for you to get better, for you to get back up and become stronger, to learn from your mistakes and become the man, the woman that God's called you to. How many are thankful that God gives grace for every person in the room? And so if we think that what we do defines who we are, we're going to be on this roller coaster of feeling good about God, feeling good about going to church, feeling good about uh, our life or feeling terrible and feeling like God doesn't want me in the room. That's what we've got to come back to. Who am I? So Paul and Priscilla and Aquila, they start working together. They start making tents. They start preaching the gospel. People in Corinth get saved, and then people get angry, and they want to kill Paul. This happened everywhere he went. People hated Paul. By the way, here's another thing. Just because people don't like you doesn't mean God doesn't love you. Just because people are mad at you doesn't mean that God's not madly in love with you. Just because people might reject you doesn't mean that God won't accept you. And so God always had a plan for Paul, no matter who was for him or against him. If God be for you, who can be against you? Come on, how many of y'all know God is for you because he made you not on accident, not so he could hate you the rest of your life. He made you because he is for you. He loves you and he doesn't make accidents. He doesn't make mistakes. And here's one thing I love. In verse nine of Acts 18, it says, one night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. And he said these words, do not be afraid. 
Did you know that those words right there, do not be afraid, those four words happen 365 times in Scripture. 365 times God speaks, do not be afraid. That's a do not be afraid for every day of the year. Every day of the year, I can wake up and hear the word from God, do not be afraid about August 28th. 2022. Do not be afraid tomorrow on August 29th. Do not be afraid about Christmas. Do not be afraid about Thanksgiving. But God, what about this? What about the economy? What about inflation? What about gas price? What about who's in office? Do not be afraid. When you know who is with you, when you know who is on your side, when you know who's watching over you, the God of angel armies, you can have a firm posture in whatever season you're in that God has me, that God's, I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I know who holds tomorrow. So, So Paul hears God say, do not be afraid. Why did Paul need to hear that? Because he was facing death threats everywhere he went. Paul wasn't sure if he was going to get killed tomorrow. Paul wasn't sure if he was going to have enough money to make it on the next missions trip. But God said these words, do not be afraid. And then I love the next part, keep on preaching. Keep on preaching, Paul. Don't be afraid. Keep on preaching, Ashley. Don't be afraid. Keep on preaching, Daniel. Don't be afraid. Keep on speaking. Keep on working. Keep on moving. Keep on going. Somebody say, keep on keeping on. Man, I'm feeling that. I could just preach on that right there. So many people stop because of fear. They stop. They put a period where God put a comma. And they go, well, Paul, people don't like me. People are mad at me. I made too many mistakes. Paul killed people. And Jesus used him to save people. Did you know when Paul walked into heaven, he was celebrated by the very people he killed? When Paul walked into heaven, there was Christians that he had martyred before he became a good guy. He used to be a bad guy. So when he gets into heaven, guess who was right there? Stephen. Stephen was the guy that Paul approved of the stoning of Stephen in front, watched Stephen get killed, laid his coat right there, and yet God used Paul to do it. Don't tell me God can't use you because you got a past, because you made too many mistakes, because you got too much anxiety, too much stress, you've been through too many problems, you made too many bad choices. Here's the thing. God uses everyone that the world says is unqualified. God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies those he calls. So God says to Paul, keep on preaching, keep on preaching. Don't be silent. Four, verse 10, for I am with you and no one is going to attack you. Let me pause right there. Look at verse 12 and we're going to come back to verse 10. Look at verse 12. While Paul was preaching in Corinth, the Jews made a united attack on Paul. Now, God just said, no one's going to attack you. But literally a verse later, a whole group of people attacked Paul. But you've got to remember what God says next. No one's going to be able to harm you. In other words, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. It doesn't mean that the weapon won't be formed. It doesn't mean there won't be attacks. It's just the attacks won't be able to stop what the purpose and the pl- God's purpose will prevail in your life. How many are thankful that you've made it through some things that should have killed you, that should have stopped you? There was weapons formed against you, but they didn't prosper. Otherwise, you wouldn't be sitting in church today, still worshiping Jesus, still lifting your hands. Come on, some of y'all have conquered cancer. You've conquered all kinds of sickness, disease issues, problems, divorce, all kinds of pain that you walk through, abuse that you walk through, and yet you're still standing. Is there anyone still standing on the other side of the attacks that you've walked through? Yeah. And sometimes the attacks are our own fault. Sometimes the attacks are other people. But here's the deal. God was saying, Paul, no weapon formed against you. You are immortal until your work is finished. You are immortal until you finish the race I've called you to run. In other words, you're going to get to where I've called you to go, and there won't be anyone who stops you. They might try to stop you, but you're going to make it. Somebody say, I'm going to make it. And then God says this, I have many people in this city for you. Verse 10, verse 10, he says, I have many people. This is what Elijah told his assistant. He says, there are more for us than those who are against us. See, Elijah's servant in 1 Kings 18 was focused, or 2 Kings chapter 4, he was, Elisha's servant was focused on who was against them. And Elijah, Elisha says, 
Lord, open his eyes to see that there are more people that are for us than those who are against us. I got good news for you today. You got more on your side than those who are against you. Amen? Okay, so Paul goes on to preach. God does amazing things. God lights up the city of Corinth, and then God moves Paul on. And uh, God uses a guy named Apollos to continue the work there. Priscilla and Aquila, they do amazing things. Now go with me to chapter 19, chapter 19. Paul was a uh, great preacher and he did amazing things. And I wanna kind of show you something here. Um, In verse 11, while Paul was preaching, he had just got done raising up a lot of disciples in this city, um, in Greece. And there was unusual miracles that happened. So much so, in verse 12, that handkerchiefs and aprons that touched Paul were taken to the sick, and their illnesses were cured, and evil spirits left them. Now, just for a second, imagine, what if we saw that kind of power right here in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where literally people, you would go out into the city, and because you've been in the house, you've been in the presence of God, you've been, it, you've been prayed up, you've been worshiping Jesus, that when you went back to your company, just the fragrance you carried of victory impacted everywhere you went. People went from depressed to going into a place of joy. People went from feeling sick and lonely and tired to feeling like God is for them and their best days are under. Could, could we imagine that God wants to use what he's doing in your your life to touch other people's lives. And I believe the sickness wasn't just physical sickness. I believe it was, it was emotional sickness. We've seen miracles happen here where people went and laid hands on the sick. They were healed. But we've seen people in this church who went into their company and they prayed for people who were battling tormenting spirits, just feeling headaches all the time, feeling confused. But because they sat with a member from victory, they went from being confused to feeling peaceful. They went from feeling depressed, discouraged, possessed, uh, overwhelmed to being a person who's now serving in the dream team with so much joy, so much love, so much life, so much laughter. This is what happened in the city, is that because God was doing something in them, it started spreading to everyone around them. And some people thought it was so great, they wanted to copy what they saw. In verse 13, this is where it gets interesting. There were some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits And they tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon possessed. The only problem was they weren't personally connected to Jesus. These Jews didn't have a personal relationship with Jesus, so they wanted to copy what they had seen someone else do. It'd be like someone who's kind of watching from a distance and they see, you know, uh, some great preacher come through the room and pray and people get healed and, 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 and people get set free and someone takes exactly the sermon they preached and tries to preach it without personally spending time with Jesus and having a personal revelation of the sermon for themselves between them and God. Just copying words, copy paste, right? This was copyright infringement here. And so they would say, in the name of the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Look at that. In the name of the Jesus whom Paul preaches. You can already tell, you're just cringing. You're like, that doesn't even sound right. I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. One day, the evil spirit answered them. Jesus, I know, and Paul, I know. But who are you? Turn to that person next to you and say, who are you? Who are you? Who are you anyways? Lord, I pray that you'd speak to us today. Let us leave encouraged, refreshed, reminded who we are in Christ. And I pray, God, that we would leave better than we came in. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Okay, so let's talk about this. I got four questions for you this morning. Number one, who are you? Who are you? Let's just start with that one right there. (laughs) Who are you? And this question is a question that's asked all around the world in every society, every generation. Who are you? Um, I remember someone was asking me this question when I was in college, and I was like, I'm Paul. And they were like, yeah, but who are you? And I was like, I'm Paul David Darty. And they were like, but who are you? And I was like, stop, you're making me insecure by how many times you keep asking me that. I gave you my name. They're like, I don't want your name. I want to know who you are. And I was like, well, I'm, I'm a son of a pastor. And they were like, 
I didn't ask who you're the son of. I asked, who are you? I was like, ah, I just felt attacked immediately. I was so fragile, you know, and, uh, and, and they just kept on pointing these questions. Who are you? And I was like, well, I'm a janitor here at ORU. This is when I was uh, picking up nachos in the baseball stadium at ORU. And uh, I said, you know, I'm a janitor. They're like, I didn't ask what your job is. I asked, who are you? I said, stop, stop, stop. This is just two. And she just kept going at me. She kept going at me. This this girl. And, and, and I was like, stop asking it. She just kept on asking, who are you? And it drove me to a place of trying to really think about it. Who am I? Who am I? And I went back to my, my uh, dorm room and I started thinking about it, started really pondering, who am I? I'm not, I've got to stop identifying that, I, yes, thankfully, I'm the son of Billy Joe and Sharon Darty, but who am I apart from my bloodline relatives? Who am I apart from the job who am I apart from the school I go to? Who, who am I? And I started looking in the scriptures and started finding that who I am in Christ is my true identity, that I am a child of God. I am a masterpiece created in his image to do good works. You are a child. Be- Listen, before you're the son of your mom and dad, you are a son of the most high. You're a daughter of the most high. He created you in his image image. The first thing the devil does as the serpent in the garden is he starts getting Adam and Eve to question, did God really say? Did God really say this about you? Did God really say that you can't be wiser than him? Did God really? And the serpent starts confusing who they are. Right now in our society, one of the biggest problems we have is confusion. And it's starting now. It's being taught in kindergarten across schools in America, uh, first grade, second grade, just confusing ideas and getting kids to really wonder, who am I? Am I really a boy? Am I really a girl? Do I really have these thoughts, these feelings? And, and so we're, now we've got nations teaching people, kids at a young age, to identify, self-identify who you are. Here's the problem with that. We don't really know who we are based on our feelings or our thoughts, our wants or desires, so we can be confused every single day, right? You could, you could think that you're someone or something that you really aren't, but because you feel that way today, that's what you self-identify as. Can I tell you the real identity that God has for you, the real identity that you need to walk in is only gonna be found in the word of God. It's not gonna be found in a textbook at school. It's not gonna be found through a teacher's ideas or a coach's ideas or even a parent. Listen, we've gotta come back. Who does God say I am? Who has God made me to be? That he made you on purpose for a purpose. I remember I was going through a season where I was really discouraged, disappointed. I felt unworthy, unqualified. I didn't feel like I I was called to preach that well. I wanted to preach, but I felt like I wasn't good at it. And I remember driving up to this church, sitting in the parking lot on a Saturday night, 4.45 p.m., hardly any cars here. Service was about to start in 10 minutes, and I was like, God, ain't nobody want to hear me preach. You don't want to hear me preach. I don't even want to hear me preach. This is not going well. By the way, in Acts chapter 20, Paul was a long-winded preacher. He literally, he literally caused a guy to die in the middle of his sermon because he was preaching too long. We're going to get there. But <laughs> Paul's identity needed to be separated from his preaching ability because people didn't always think Paul was a great preacher. People didn't always like Paul. And I'm not talking about this Paul. I'm talking about Paul in the Bible. You're like, well, you too. But here's the good news. Our identity doesn't have to be in how people see us, what people say about us, what America teaches us, and that's good news because we would be confused and insecure and feeling constantly good and bad on a roller coaster of identity crisis, midlife crisis, quarter life crisis, teenage identity crisis, childhood crisis, constant trauma, trying to determine who I am. But the good news is God speaks through the trauma. He speaks through the pain. He speaks through the rejection. And he says, you are still my son. And I have a purpose for you. And that day in the parking lot, I wrote down on this napkin in my car as I was crying because the Lord said, change the narrative. Change the narrative. You will go in the direction of your self-image. If yourself, little people do little things. 
And listen, you don't have to be a little person. It's not how tall you are on the outside. It's how tall you see yourself on the inside. It's not how strong you are on the outside. You can have huge muscles, but have the most insecure internal self-image. So when you look in the mirror, it doesn't matter how good your muscles look. If you think you're a little guy, you're constantly going to be walking around with the little man syndrome, you know, just constantly feeling un- uh, you're not good enough. And, and, but here's the good news. We can look in the mirror and go, I'm a child of God. I am made in his image. I am here on purpose because I have a purpose. God is with me. I am not insecure. I am not unqualified. The Lord has called me. He's anointed me for such a time as this. What is that? That's scripture. That scripture that I'm putting, and you're like, well, that's kind of out of context. That was only for Gideon and Jeremiah and David. No, that was for you. That was for me. Why would God give us his word if it was only for the guys from thousands of years ago? It's for us today. And if the church in 2022 doesn't have an image that's based in Christ, and we think, well, no, God wants us to think that we're poor and we're ugly and we're not good enough and we're unqualified and we're constantly afflicted and addicted and possessed. No, God wants to see you as victorious. You're the head and not the tail. You're above and not, you are blessed coming in and blessed going out. Listen, the Lord is for you. He's not against you. And he doesn't want you thinking all the time that you're here on accident because he made you on accident and you're gonna live an accidental life. No, you are here on purpose because you have a purpose. Who are you? You're a child of God. Did anyone see the movie Lion King? Come on. I remember sitting in Bible college when Ron McIntosh was teaching. And uh, how many are thankful for Pastor Ron McIntosh? (laughs) Sitting here on the front row. He shows this video clip from Lion King. And I was like, yes, because I learned from movies. And I love, so I love it when there's a movie in a service. So I almost just wanted to show Lion King to y'all today. But I don't have enough. We got to get through the book of Acts real fast here. So uh, I'll just give you a quick scenario. There's this moment where Simba, the son of Mufasa, his dad dies. His uncle Scar is a bad guy. And Scar makes Simba feel like it's all your fault. Your dad died on your watch and you're the one to blame. That is the accuser that's speaking. In the Bible, the accuser is the devil. He constantly accuses you. Shame on you, Paul. Shame on you. You made a mistake. You're a failure. That's what the devil constantly says. By the way, if you hear shame on you, it's never from God. God is not a God of shame. God is not a God of condemnation. He is a God of mercy and grace. His mercy triumphs over his wrath. If you grew up with an abusive father or a verbally abusive mother or father, whatever it was, that's not God speaking. Oh, that's all I hear is just constant shame and con. If all you hear is a constant shame on you and you did this wrong and you're never good enough, all that stuff, that's not from God. And so Simba runs off into the jungle and runs away from his purpose, his calling, his throne, and uh, he joins a a, a group of Timon and Pumbaa. And uh, (laughs) Timon and Pumbaa, Akuna Matata, right? What a wonderful phrase. It means no worries for the rest of your days. It's a problem free philosophy, Akuna Matata. So Simba lives in the Akuna Matata world and era for a season. He grows up and uh, you kind of watch him and, and, and he's walking through the jungle with Timon and Pumbaa. And the whole time he knows I am running from where I'm supposed to be, what I'm supposed to be doing and who I'm supposed to be leading. Why was he running? Shame, shame, labels, constantly feeling not good enough, constantly feeling like, man, I made too many mistakes to go back there. I made too many mistakes to be welcomed back there. So he's living in the jungle until Nala shows up. And Nala, that was his girlfriend. You know what I'm talking about. So Nala was like, Simba, you are called back to the throne. You have a purpose on your life. Thank God for the Nalas in your life that are calling you back to your purpose, your assignment. I got a Nala sitting over there on the front row. Ashley Hope Nala. All right, so Nala starts talking to Simba, and she's like, listen, you have an assignment, and this jungle needs you as the king. You are the rightful heir. And he goes, no, 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 no. I made mistakes. Scar is the one that's leading it. She goes, listen, Scar has turned it into the dark world. Like she's, the Scar's messing it up. He's got a dark spirit. It's not good. And then Rafiki speaks to Simba. (laughs) Don't get caught up in all the magic of it. Just hear the message for a second. You're like, this is not good. Witchcraft. I bind witchcraft too in Jesus' name. Let me just tell the story. So Rafiki says to Simba, 
your father is still alive. And he goes, no, he's not. No, he's not. He's dead. And he said, he lives in you. And so Simba looks in the water. And all, first, he sees his own reflection. And he sees constant shame, condemnation. He looks at his face and he's like, gosh, just a lion that's made too many mistakes, right? Until he looks up and he hears his father start speaking, Mufasa. He says, you are my son and you are the king and you are the rightful heir. And Simba goes back to the land, right? And he leads the land and and it's amazing. But I remember when Ron showed that video, tears started coming down my eyes because I started realizing I have seen myself in the water through the lens of my own mistakes. And until I get my eyes up on who does God say I am, I will constantly be running from who God's called me to be and what God's called me to do. And the same is for you today, that you will be on a roller coaster of feeling qualified this week, next week, this year, to do what God's called you to do, to feel worthy enough to come into church, to feel worthy to to be a dad, a mom, husband, a wife, a leader in your company, an influence in Tulsa or wherever you live until you get back on who has God called me to be? Who are you? Secondly, why are you here? That's the second question. If you're taking notes, why am I here? Why am I here? Why am I on planet earth in 2022? Why did God choose to make me? What is my why? When you lose your why, you lose your way. Your why is not to make a a paycheck. Your why is not to live in a big house. You don't, you, God didn't put you here to say, I don't know, why am I here? I guess I'm here to, uh, you know, to get married, to have kids, to, to make some money and then retire on the lake and live in a, in a house and, and, and drive a boat. No, 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 that's not why. Why are you here? You gotta dig deeper. I've gotta dig deeper. Why am I here? And being a dad is a great thing. It's an amazing thing. It's a calling. Being a mom, it's a great thing. Being a wife, a husband, those are great things. But that is not your ultimate why in life. Your ultimate why, when you lose your why, you lose your way. If you think your why is to do this or to do that, anything outside of what I'm about to say, Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. What is that? Matthew chapter five, verse 13 through 15. He says, you're a city on a hill. Your calling, your job, if you wanna know, what is my job, what is my why? My why is to bring glory to God. And I can bring glory to God as a single, as a married person, as a dad, as, as a mom, whatever season of life you're in, you can always know your why. What's my why? To bring glory to God. I can do it as a janitor picking up nachos in the baseball stadium. I can do it as a pastor on a stage. You don't have to be a missionary to have a great why. You don't have to be a pastor or a worship leader to have a great why. You can have a great why wherever you are, whatever you're doing, whatever your paycheck is, whatever your title is, whatever your status of relationship is, your why. Everybody say, my why is to bring glory to God. Okay, now this is important because this group of people who were trying to invoke the name of Jesus and they were trying to move with a sense of purpose and significance, they didn't know who they were and they didn't really know why they were there. They were just trying to copy and paste someone else's why. They were trying to copy and paste someone else's identity. And here's what happens. Look at, let's go back to Acts 19. When they did this, the, the, the demon spirit responds, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? And the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them and he gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. Now, we're not gonna do like an illustrated sermon on this right now, but... You know me, I'm always looking for somebody. Daniel, come on up here. No, I'm just kidding. Um, (laughs) Stop that. But here's what happened. Uh, Because they didn't have a firm identity and they didn't have a, a firm why, they were stripped of the authority that they could have been walking in. They were stripped of the, 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 the dignity that God intended for them to walk in. Your, who you are and why you're here produces a firm, not just core identity, but a sense of dignity. You walk in authority. When I know who I am and I know why I'm here, then I don't go into situations or places where I'm going to run out bleeding and naked uh, from insecurity because someone questioned, who are you? That one question 
they didn't have an answer for. They didn't know who they were, and it left them stunned to the point where they lost their dignity. They lost their authority. And this became known around the whole area of Greece and Ephesus. And uh, there was such a fear of God that hit the whole city because of this strange encounter where people's identity was questioned and, and the evil spirits took over that Paul came in and he was able to preach with such power. God used what the enemy was trying to use against him. God used it for good through Paul to bring the gospel and thousands of people got saved. Hundreds of people were getting healed. By the way, God is still healing people in 2022. He's still casting out demons and he's still healing the sick and raising the dead. We've seen it in this church. We had a girl die on our staff uh, two years ago in the month of August, her name's Ashley Anspaugh. Is she in the room today? Ashley and Jonathan, they go to the 11 a.m. But Ashley died and our church started praying and she came back to life. It was a wild resurrection miracle. So if you don't believe in miracles, I'm telling you, you came to the right place to be convinced because we have walking, talking miracles in this room. But there arose a great disturbance in verse 25 and there was a confusion that hit the whole city. And um, in that moment, Paul really wanted to stay, but the, the Christians there said, Paul, you've got to go. And the more he prayed about it, the more he sensed where God was leading him. The more he began to sense what God was asking him to do. And this is the next question I want to ask you is, where are you going? Number three, where are you going? Where are you headed? Where is your marriage headed? Where are your kids headed? Where are you headed? Where's your values headed? Where's your character going? And this is a question to dig deep personally, not to go, well, I know where this person's character goes. I know where they, no, no, no. This is like, I know I'm gonna pass this sermon on to so-and-so. Pass it on to you today. And think about it. Where? Proverbs 29 says, without a vision, people cast off restraint. Where there is no vision, there's no direction. If I don't know where I'm going, then I'll just compromise anything and everything that feels good in the moment. And we're in a time where the world is losing direction. They're throwing out the compass, the moral compass, the biblical compass, and people are losing, where is true north? People are just going, oh, this sounds exciting. I wanna go where it feels exciting and fun and I just wanna have a good time and I'm just gonna try to heal myself in this way and that way and I'm gonna try to figure it out on my own. I don't know, you gotta come back to who determines where I should go? And Paul was so submitted to the Holy Spirit. He was saying, God, I want you to be in charge of my steps. Your word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. Where are you? Who's determining the direction of your life? So Paul submitted and surrendered his will to God. In fact, there's one scripture in Acts 19, I want the band to come up, where he says, if it's the Lord's will, I will go to Ephesus. If it's not, I won't. We sang a song today that I wrote last summer. And in the song, it says, Lord, if you're not the one leading me, I don't want to go. If you're not the voice that's calling me, I don't want to hear it. If your presence doesn't go with me, I won't follow. Lord, if it's just you and me, that's all I need because we're the majority. And those words came from, these scriptures came from Exodus 33, where Moses was talking to God and Moses said, God, if you're not in it, I don't want to be in it. If you're not leading, I don't want to follow. If it's not your voice, I don't want to go. If it's in my, if it's me, if it's my feelings, my desires, my wants, my lust, if it's, if it's anything that's not you, I don't want to. But then Moses says, but if you go, if your presence goes, I will follow you wherever you lead. I will go wherever you want me to go. And Moses was desiring so much to have God's presence with him. Where are you going? When you know where you're going, then there's nothing that can stop you. Paul said, I am going to Jerusalem and then I'm headed to Rome. And that is where I'm headed. Now, ultimately, Paul knew heaven is my final destination. How many of y'all know your final destination is heaven? Come on. Some of y'all are like, I don't know, maybe it's Colorado, Florida. No, no, your final destination is heaven. You might go some other places in your lifetime. You might live in some other places, but ultimately heaven is my destination. So if heaven is my destination, then I need to be inviting heaven's will 
into my life here on earth on a regular basis. This is why Jesus said, pray this prayer every day. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in my life as it is in heaven, on Tulsa, on victory, as it is in heaven. I want, if my final destination is heaven, if that's where I'm headed, then I need to make sure I'm on the highway, not to hell, but the highway to heaven. That I'm, and you might be off track right now, but the good news is you're only one on-ramp away from getting back on the right highway. You're in the right place. You're watching the right online message. Wherever you're watching from, God's calling you. He says, get back, get back to where I've called you to go. I've called you to go in this direction. And so I want to go to Acts 20. And, and it says, um, after the confusion kind of ended, Paul called the disciples together and he encouraged them. And he said goodbye. And he traveled through that area speaking many words of encouragement, which, which leads me to my last fourth question. What are you called to do? What are you called to do? What, what, is, what is that? What's your what? And your what is, that's, that's your specific assignment. Some of you in the room, you're called to teach. Some of you in the room, you're called to serve. You're called to be a hospitality you know, person where you open your home up. Some of you are called to be a businessman, businesswoman. God has gifted you to prosper. He's given you unique ideas. What are those gifts that God's put in your hand? What is the talents that he placed? Jesus tells the story of the talents that some had a few. One guy had one. One guy had two. One guy had five. And the, and the real question is, are you multiplying what he's put in your hand? Everywhere Paul went, he knew his what. And his what wasn't determined on who responded or how they responded, because look at this. In verse, uh, verse eight, there were many lamps in the upstairs room where Paul was preaching, and um, seated in the window was a young man named Eutychus, who was sinking into a deep sleep while Paul was preaching. Now, I know that doesn't happen on Sunday mornings. I'm just kidding, it does. We caught a guy on the second row a year ago. He was snoring, sawing logs. It was like, and I couldn't keep preaching. I literally was like, this is comical. I was laughing and I was like giving Henshaw the eyeball. And so finally somebody woke him up, but bless his heart. All right. <laughs> this guy was sinking into a deep sleep while Paul was talking. I love this in verse, verse nine. It says, Paul talked on and on. Y'all are like, yep, just like this, Paul. When he was sound asleep, he fell to the ground from the third story. This guy died in Paul's sermon. It was so long. And, um, and, and so he's dead, and Paul goes down in verse 10. I'm glad that the story doesn't end there. <laughs> that would just be so sad, and he died. But Paul goes down, and he throws himself on the young man. Now, I want to illustrate this to you. Ron, lay down. No, I'm kidding. This would be a cringy moment. This would go viral on YouTube, just me on top of Ron. But uh, Paul throws himself on top of the guy, puts his arms around him, and he says, don't be alarmed. He's alive. I love that, that God brought this young boy back to life. <laughs> That's a good, good way to end the story. And the people took the young man home, and then Paul kept on preaching. So, you know, Paul just, he knew what is what it was, and he just didn't, didn't let it stop him. Which leads me to the last verse that I, I just love this verse. Paul starts talking to them. And he gets to verse uh, 18. He says, you know that when I was here, from the first day I came, I served God with all my heart. I tried my best to walk in humility with tears in the midst of severe testing that I was going through. I never stopped preaching. And he says, you know that I haven't hesitated to share the good news with you. I've not held back anything that God's called me to speak. I've declared to both Jews and Greeks that it's time to turn to God in repentance, to have faith in the Lord. That's what I want to preach. Just repentance. Just change your heart, change your mind, receive his forgiveness, and have faith. Somebody say, have faith. So repentance is just turning to the Lord, just saying, God, I repent. Lord, I want your will, your way. God, I, no longer do I want to go after the things of the flesh. Lord, I want your spirit to lead me and guide me. And then he says, have faith in God. And then he says, now compelled by the spirit, I'm bound by the spirit. I am going to Jerusalem. And I don't know what's going to happen to me next. I don't know. I can't, I can't figure out what tomorrow holds. But I do know who holds tomorrow. And he says, I know the Holy Spirit's warned me it's not going to be easy. That there's hardships that are in front of me. 
but God is with me. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I've overcome the world. I can tell you this, the rest of 2022 is not gonna be easy for you, but God is with you, God is for you, and you got the victory, and your best days are not behind you, and God has not abandoned you, and God has not forsaken you, God has not forsaken this nation, God has not forsaken the dreams, the prayers you've been praying. And Paul ends it with this, this verse right here, he says, and none of these things I love the New King James Version. He says, but none of these things move me. Just throw that verse up there. And I want us just to ponder that verse if we've got it. All right, there it is. Let's say that together. But none of these things move me. Just stop right there. What things have been moving you lately? What things have been, have, have hardships tried to move you off your assignment? Has there been disappointment, disillusionment, discouragement? Has there been fear, anxiety, personal mistakes, mistakes of others? What's been trying to move you off of God's purpose for your life? What's been trying to move you out of that identity, being firmly rooted and established in who God says you are? What's been trying to move you? Recently, I was having to sit and discipline one of our sons, and uh, I'll just tell you who it was. It was Mac. He's four, and he's, he's, he's a joy. He just really... He really develops who we are in Christ. And um, he's really strengthening our patience and our love. And, and so Mac, Mac was just, he was not moving. I said, Mac, come here. And he was like, <clears throat> and I go, Mac, come here. And he's like, <clears throat> and so I get closer and he's like, mommy. And mommy's like, no, you gotta go to daddy. And he's like, no, you know, and he was unmovable. And, um, I just had this image in my mind when I was reading this scripture. Ron, could I borrow you for a moment? Okay, this, this one's gonna be a good illustration. Would you stand and face the church? And Tim and Daniel and Drew and Wyatt, would y'all come over here? And, and I want y'all to stand on both sides, but I want you to put your arms against him like this. Y'all face this direction. Y'all face this direction. And I want you to act like you're pushing them. And Ron, if you could get in kind of a runner's stance and just face this way, right? Okay. This, this is where Paul was at. This is where Paul the apostle was at. He was saying, there are all kinds of things that have come against me. There's all kinds of wounds that have in, 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 been inflicted against me by people, by places, by hurts, by disappointments. And it's not that Paul hadn't seen some amazing trophies and miracles and breakthroughs and revivals. I mean, Paul had seen, it's not like Paul was complaining, saying, I've never seen a good day in my life. Paul had seen amazing days. But life is hard sometimes. Anyone just felt like, man, life is hard sometimes. 10 of us in the room. The rest of y'all just have an easy life. The rest, but those of you that go, goodness, life is just not easy some days. Paul sets himself like this. And it's like he's looking straight at Rome. He's looking straight at the finish line. And he says, none of these things move me. None of these things. None of these things. He says, nor do I count my life dear to myself so that I may finish my race with joy, with joy. I'm going to finish with, I'm not going to finish with depression. I'm not going to finish with resentment. I'm not going to finish with bitterness. I'm not going to finish shaking my fist at everybody who hurt me. I'm going to finish with joy, joy, joy. And the ministry which God gave me, I'm going to keep testifying about the grace, the gospel of the grace, grace of God. Would you stand to your feet all over this room? Some of you are right there. Man, I could just feel it. Oh, Jesus. I can see it. I can see it in the spirit. Some of you are right there. And I just hear God saying, I'm going to breathe fresh grace on you. You're going to know who you are. You already know who you are, but God's just reminding you. Today was not like new theology. It's just a reminder. You know who you are. You know why you're here. You know where you're going. 
and you know what you're supposed to do. So don't let anything stop you. Don't you let anyone stop you. Don't you let yourself stop you. Sometimes I'm my biggest enemy, the inner me, the thoughts, the feelings, the personal regrets, whatever it is. Paul said, none of these things move me. I'm pressing on. I'm forgetting what's behind me. And I'm pressing onward, onward. With heads bowed and eyes closed, if you're here today, and God's speaking to you that it's time to move forward, that it's time to firmly establish who you are in Christ, where you're going, what you're supposed to do, and why you're here. I want you to just lift your hand up. God's talking to you today. You feel like, you, yeah, none of these things move me. All over this room, from the front to the back, this sermon was for you. God was speaking to you. Yeah, in that very back row, I see you. It's like God made this message for you in the back row. He's not finished with you yet. Secondly, you're here and you say, man, I'm just, I need to get things right with God. I need to lay some things down at the altar. I need to surrender my heart to Jesus. If that's you, raise your hand. Today's your day for salvation, repentance, forgiveness, grace, a second chance, a fresh start. Or maybe you just need prayer today. Would you leave your seat? If you raised your hand or you just need to get down to the altar today to surrender, to receive prayer. And I want to, I want to join you at this altar. Let's cheer on brave men, brave women, husbands, wives, mothers, fathers, sons, daughters, grandparents, whatever age you are, whatever season of life you're in, you are valuable. You are a child of God. You are forgiven. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. God's not finished. He's not done. None of these things are going to move you in Jesus' name. Keep on preaching. Keep on running your race. Keep on looking to Jesus. Keep on running after him. Let's just worship God all over this place.
I just feel to say this to someone today. This sermon's not just for you, it's for someone who, who knows you, someone you know that needs to be reminded of who they are in Christ. Some of you know someone who's struggling with identity issues. I don't even have to ask you to raise your hand. You just know. You're like, my goodness, I got a friend that's just battling suicidal thoughts, depression, anxiety, stress. Maybe you know someone who's walking through a divorce or walking through just hurts, wounds, and you're like, I just pray that God helps him. God's going to use you to give this message to them that God's not finished with their story, that God loves them, that they are valuable. My brother's over here praying for people at the altar, and he doesn't know this, but I was kind of just like feeling a certain feeling. It's like the enemy comes at you, no matter how, how great things are. I just had a certain feeling the other day leading up to my birthday, and I was like, oh, I don't want to get older, and then I was just like, oh, just like, you know, the enemy comes with thoughts and just accusations, all this kind of stuff, and John sends me this text, happy birthday, bro. I'm so grateful that you were born. The world, the Darty family, mom and dad, none of us would be the same if you did not exist. Your personality, Paul, your heart, your soul is unmatched. You are so special. As I was reading my brother's text, I'm just crying. I'm like, goodness. John was preaching this sermon to me. He says, you make people feel special. I hope you know how special you are too. This year is going to be a good year for you. Harvest on seeds that you've said a long time ago. I definitely think that God used this year to draw you closer to him more than you ever have. He's taking you to new depths. You're learning about who you are. Whenever you get closer to God, things that are not of God fade away. So I hope this is a year full of harvest. I'm in your corner. I love you. Happy birthday. But I just... I just think that God wants you to send a text like that to somebody. Because I guarantee you there's a whole lot of guys like that, girls, that just need to hear that text message. You are special. The world needs you to exist. God has a plan for your life. If you feel little right now, God's big on the inside you. If you feel unqualified right now, God doesn't qualify God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies those he calls. So you might not feel good enough, but God's got a plan for you, and he's still going to qualify you. Every person God used in the Bible made mistakes, wasn't perfect, but God still had a plan. for God has a plan for you. Don't push yourself out. Lord, I pray for every man in the room, every woman in the room, every guy, girl, every person who can hear this, everyone watching online, that they would know they are valuable. They are here on purpose because they have a purpose. They are not a mistake, and their future is bright. There's light at the end of the tunnel. You're going to get through this. Things get better, I promise you. Things get better. Life is going to get better. You're going to make it. You're going to see the victory in Jesus' name. Just pray this with me. Say, Jesus, I surrender to you. You died on the cross for my sins. You rose from the dead. I confess you as my Lord and Savior. I repent and I receive your grace. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me and making me on purpose for a purpose. My best days are right in front of me and I will see the victory because Jesus lives in me. Amen.